So anyway, guys, we're on back. And uh, this will be the next episode of Ron's Hard Rock and Metal Tales. Now we're in 1982. 1982. That's a big, big year. Big year. A lot of stuff happened during that year. Um, first thing, probably one of the most important things, formed the first band. The first band was called Valiant Force. And uh, it featured myself, uh, this one drummer named Darren, um, guitar player friend of mine who I met at a gig, and I'll, I'll come to that because that's a very important aspect of it. So uh, that was a big deal because that's when I first started, okay, got to write songs, got to really learn how to play properly, um, learning how to deal with, you know, a band because a band is kind of like a business. And uh, yeah, that was a big deal. So anyway, so, you know, felt like, yeah, all right, I'm on my way now. Been to a couple of gigs. Um, albeit they were gigs from a friend of mine, my friend Corey White from school, and uh, started reading the local, you know, the local papers, seeing what bands were out there. But of course, you know, I open up the LA Weekly or I open up a BAM or uh, also a Music Connection. I'm looking, and I don't know who these bands are. And, you know, 18, <laughs> 19 years old, man, I didn't have a whole lot of money. You know, I'm working over here at McDonald's or I'm working over here at this whatever part-time job just to make a little money uh, so I can one buy gear and also you know get out there and see you know see local music so I can see what's going on what, what people are, are checking out so Carl and Corey hey man you know uh, recommend me some good bands to go see and so the first band he says go see Rat they're cool dude and I'm like okay Rat Rat okay I'm like Rat so they have like a Rat mascot So I'm looking through the paper, and sure enough, uh, Rat is playing at the Roxy on Sunset Strip in Hollywood. So I'm like, all right, let me go check out this band. Um, this is solo. I went by myself, asked a few friends. They were like, you know, they were like, never heard of the band. They weren't really into it. So I was like, all right, fine, let's go by myself. So I went by myself. Uh, back then, it's 1982, tickets were cheap. I think that gig was 10 bucks to get in. Uh, 18 and over, so fortunately I could get in. Couldn't drink, but didn't really care. because I wasn't there to drink, I was there to see music. And, um, you know, this is the Roxy. This was a big deal, man. You know, the Roxy on Sunset Boulevard, and right next to the Roxy was the Rainbow. Rainbow Bar and Grill, where all the rock stars hung out. And I was like, ooh, okay, this is cool. So, went to the gig, and um, also on the bill, Rat was headlining. The opening band was some band called White Sister that featured the guitar player. I think he was a former student of Randy Rhodes. You know, he had long blonde hair. He was playing a white Les Paul. Um, I wasn't really into their music. It was just kind of like, I don't know, run of the mill, hard rock. Wasn't, wasn't anything to speak of. Second band on the bill was Dubrow. Kevin Dubrow renamed the band Dubrow after uh, Randy Rhodes and um, uh, Rudy Sarzo joined Ozzy. And so I guess he didn't want to call it Quiet Riot because I guess he felt like, well, you know, Randy's gone, Rudy's gone, so it's not really Quiet Riot. So he renamed the band Dubrow. And uh, that was also with Carlos Cavazzo on guitar. And, uh, I mean, they were cool. I mean, it's quite right. You know, it was th this was them before they had a record deal or any of that. And, uh, you know, they, they played, you know, Slick Black Cadillac, which was cool. I'd actually heard that from uh, a friend who happened to have the Japanese import of that Quiet Right album. Um, so they came on, they played, you know, they were cool. And then, you know, the place was buzzing because Rat. And uh, I noticed the crowd, the crowd got thicker. It was, it was more densely packed because I was standing at, up at the front of the stage and I met <clears throat> who turned out to be longtime friends, people I've known for, dude, like over 40 years. 
So I, I, I met uh, a couple of guys there, a guy named Byron Medina, who is now a, uh, he's a world-class uh, photographer specializing in headshots. Um, and uh, this other guy, Herb, you know, because they were friends. And we got to talking, and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, because they were from Torrance. I'm like, oh, okay, because I knew people, you know, who live in, in Torrance. If you're not familiar with Torrance, Torrance is a, a city. It's about, I don't want to say like 10, 12 miles south of Los Angeles uh, in the area called the South Bay. So it's, um, you know, all these cities there south of Los Angeles. Uh, so we got to talking, and we shared a lot of common musical taste, and so we were just hanging out. And then Rat came on, and... Uh, it was pretty epic because it was, because it was, you know, <laughs> it was rad. I was like, I was like, what, what is this? Interesting. At that time, because uh, for those of you who may not know it, Rat's originally from uh, San Diego, California. They're not really from Los Angeles. They moved up to LA because they outgrown the scene in San Diego. And, you know, of course, all the music industry was in L.A. Um, and they'd been through a few different um, lead guitar players. At the time I saw them, ironically, the, the lineup was this. It was um, Robin Crosby. So he was playing, you know, second. He was playing guitar, lead and rhythm. Juan Crucier, bass player. Everybody knows Juan Crucier. Stephen Piercy, vocals, yeah, of course. Bobby Blotzer on drums. And their main lead guitar player was none other than Mark Torian. And this is kind of funny because Mark Torian, everyone knows since decades, is the lead singer for Bullet Boys. Well, at this time, at this point, he was playing guitar in Rat. And uh, yeah, they were cool, man. I mean, it was like, uh, you know. <laughs> However it goes, I don't know how it goes. I never learned it. Anyway, um, and I was just like, whoa. You know, first off, right up front. And back then, you know, because I'm, I'm just young and dumb. <laughs> Might have been a good idea to have some earplugs or at the very least some cotton. Man, ungodly loud. I'm right in front of these Marshall stacks, man. These are Marshall 100 watt stacks. JCM 800s, actually. Uh, Mark Torian, he had a black Charvel star with red spiderweb motif, a red spiderweb design. Um, and he was cool. He had, he had this like these little stage antics. So he would point and he would go, okay. And then he would do a thumbs up. It's pretty funny. He did that the whole gig. <laughs> and um, we thought, okay, wow, this guy's pretty good. Um, so, that just completely blew me away, and I be instantly became a fan of Red. I, I, I think I've, I've, I don't know how many gigs they might have played in L.A. before they got signed. Uh, they played a lot of gigs. I was probably at most gigs that Rat played. I've seen Rat at the first gig was at the Roxy. I saw them at the Whiskey. I saw them at the Troubadour. I saw them at the Country Club. Um, there, there used to be the L.A. street scene. Uh, in downtown Los Angeles where they had bands and stands and and you know people could go there it was an annual gig until they closed it because of the gang gang violence uh, but they used to go there and play and um, you know I would follow where if there was any kind of gig where rat was playing I would go see it if if you know outside of going way out to San Bernardino Riverside County or way out in Orange County because it's too far of a drive but I saw a lot of rat gigs I got to know the band um, actually used to hang out with Stephen Piercy at the Troubadour because I would go to the Troubadour very often because I always had a lot of good gigs. And he would always sit at the far end of the bar. So if you, you're familiar with the Troubadour, you walk in and, and uh, there's a stairway that goes upstairs. And then there's the stage to your right. And then there's the dance floor area. And then to your right is also the bar. And then all the way at the end is where the kitchen is. And he would usually sit behind the bar right there where the kitchen door was. And, uh, you know, he used to hang out with him, drink beer, and talk about music and whatnot. And uh, so, and this will come to the next segue. So I was like, wow, man, 
So I got to know Byron and Herb, and so we were talking. Um, I was reading, you know, fanzines, right? And I remember I bought a record review magazine, an old record review. I don't think it's even published anymore. And uh, I think Edward Van Halen was on the cover. And it said, Metal from the Rising Sun. Japanese metal. I was like, Japanese metal. You know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old school otaku. And for the, I mean, th those of you who are into anime and manga know what that means. Um, yeah, it's kind of has a double meaning. I, I like to think of the positive meaning. It's someone who is a passionate fan of anime and manga. I, you know, I used to watch the, the earliest animes that were in black and white, man. You know, you know, I'm 60 years old. I used to get up at six o'clock in the morning and they would be, there would be um, the Amazing Three in Japanese, it's called Wonder Three, or Gigantor, um, what's his, uh, Tetsujin, um, I forget how to pronounce it in Japanese, 28. Uh, you know, I used to get up before school and watch these things. Uh, Prince Planet, um, so old school. So, you know, I was like, wow, there's metal in Japan? I had to know. So I bought the magazine from the newsstand. You know, it was this one newsstand I used to go to and I, I would buy all the metal fans. You know, I used to buy Kerrang. Kerrangs were expensive back then. So 1982, a Kerrang magazine from the UK would cost five bucks. Now imagine five bucks. Now five bucks nowadays, uh, that Kerrang magazine would probably cost like 20 bucks now. <gasps> yeah, and five bucks for a fanzine, dude, but, you know, you'd look at the cover of Kerrang. I, I think the first one I bought was, a, um, it was Accept. Wolf Hoffman standing on the cover with the flying bee and he had it pointing towards the ground. Accept the, the Teutonic uh, terrors from Germany, blah, 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 whatever it was. So anyway, I get the record review magazine and I start reading it. And uh, it's actually a an article written by John Sutherland, and for those of you who know who John Sutherland is, he's a, he was a, a heavy metal writer of prominence uh, back in the 80s and 90s. He's written liner notes on albums, he's written bios for very notable um, rock, I mean hard rock and metal musicians, artists. Um, he used to write the Molten Metal column for BAM magazine, you know, with BAM, the handout. And he, he used to write the, the column there. And I used to read that avidly. Um, <laughs> I'll come to that later, but yeah, years later, I actually got to know the guy. Um, so anyway, I'm reading the article and they're talking about all these bands. Um, there was the original X featuring George Azuma on guitar. Uh, Bow Wow, the original Bow Wow, not the rapper, but Bow Wow with uh, Kyoji Yamamoto and Loudness, featuring Loudness, you know, it's like, okay, the, 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 I, I seem to recall that the article mentioned something about Van Halen and Rush, and I said, okay, so, uh, just by coincidence, I was hanging out with Byron, and he's all, oh, I got Loudness's first album. I was like, what? And so I said, man, you gotta bring that by. I'm gonna make a, a hate to admit it, but I had to make a cassette copy because I didn't have money to buy the import, man. The import for uh, the birthday eve, uh, I think he paid 13 or 15 bucks for it. I didn't have that money. <laughs> That's a lot of money for LP, LPs at that time. In 1982, man, you could get an LP for, you know, uh, three or five bucks. Uh, you know, so I got I got 20 bucks, man. I got four albums, 13, 15 bucks for one album. Oh, yeah, it's an import. Well, yeah, of course, you're paying import tariffs and all that. Anyway, he put it on and, you know, and it was a... it man <laughs> that was it 
that was it for me because you know I just started band and was playing and and, and actually that I, I sort of that's kind of a backstory for what I'm talking about now because uh, you know I just met Herb but later on we started uh, playing together and uh, I was looking for a musical direction you know I was like well, what do I want to do you know I knew what I liked um, I kind of wanted to do something sort of on the borderline of hard rock and heavy metal I didn't want to go too heavy but I didn't want to go like light rock because that just wasn't that wasn't my gig um, Everybody's like, well, man, you know, you're gonna have to do kind of a Hendrix psychedelic thing. And I'm like, dude, no, I don't. I don't have to do that. You know, I'm gonna do what I want to do. That's just stupid. But that was the mentality back then, you know, 1982, because you know, you got this, and you know, you're trying to play this, you know, hard rock music. And I'm like, well, you know, there's other musicians who have done it, who are doing it. Uh, not the least of which is. Um, Sound barrier, uh, but I'll get to them later. Um, probably the next installment because 1982, I'm probably gonna have to do maybe two, three installments on that year alone because a lot of crazy stuff happened. A lot, I, I found myself in some of the weirdest places in 1982, and I'm still wondering how, how what was I doing in the middle of that? But anyway, so I discovered loudness. So I, of course, you know, Byron was gracious and um, he let me tape birthday eve i later on i went and bought it yeah i saved up my money uh, later on but man i was listening to that album and i was just like what is this um it 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 had everything in there it had progressive elements it had the hard rock metal elements it had the virtuoso guitar playing um you know it, it had the the the, the just, the, you know, brilliant rhythm section of uh, uh, Masayoshi Yamshita and uh, Moritake Gucci. <laughs> that's, that's a drum and bass uh, duo I wish I had. And, uh, you know, I was just listening, listening, of course, you know, then I started trying to learn some of that stuff. And, you know, and Unfortunately, the, the turntable, I, it's funny because the turntables back in the late 70s, if you could find them, you could still have the, you know, 16, 45, 33, um, which was great because 16, you slow it down and you could learn the fast parts because it was an octave lower and just slower. Great. But, you know, I had a Denon and um, Denon belt drive and just one speed, 33, that was it. 33 and a third, it's nothing I could do. So I had to learn that stuff at regular tempo. But there's an advantage to that because it really trains your ears. You really got to listen. You really, really got to listen. So what I would do is I would put on my headphones or I would kind of half put them on so they'd be half sitting on my ears and part of my ears were open so I could hear what I was doing on guitar and I had my little practice amp. And that's how I learned a lot of that stuff. Because, um, you know, I didn't have any other options. And, of course, something like Loudness's music, well, unless you lived in Japan or, you know, the Asia area, songbook with tab, you can forget it. Later on, I did actually find a songbook with tablature. But, you know, that, that came at a high price because I bought that thing. I had a Loudness tab book. It had like a bunch of their music. Uh, I think it was their first two albums. And uh, that cost me, I think it was 25 bucks. Uh, I think I still have it. It's somewhere in somebody's garage in a box back in Inglewood. Unless the guy threw it away. I have to contact him and find out. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So I discovered Loudness and I was just like, And still going to see where at. And then uh, we were talking, Byron and I. And he's like, yeah, there's this one cool band from your hometown. I'm like, really? Because I'm from Pasadena. He's like, 
Yeah, they're called armored singing. So armored singing. I said, oh, that's a cool, cool name. I like that armored singing. You know, where they like dress in armor and whatnot. He's like, well, yeah, kind of. I said, all right, that's cool. And so I was looking in the paper, you know, bam. And sure enough, armored singing, they were playing at the whiskey. We'll get to that in the next installment. So until then, keep rocking. And again, if you're enjoying this content, please like, please subscribe, and you can also follow me over at Instagram, Ron Lydian 2. All right, till the next episode.